Who's hungry for the Word of God this morning? Great. Well, for those seven people that were hungry, what about the rest of you? Who's hungry for the Word of God? That's awesome. Come on. Let's be responders. Let's be responders. Our pastor is coming to share the Word of God. Get excited. The, this Word is for you. Turn to the person next to you and say, this Word is for you. It's for you. Come on. Let's welcome Pastor Justin. Jim, does that mic work or is that MD? Does that microphone work? So that everyone? Yes. Can we can we just 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 for a moment do that on trading my sorrows? Do you know that? Do you need the words? All right. Can we give Jim the words and maybe the worship team? Why don't you just jump to your feet for a moment? Let's just break something in here as we as we begin. I'm not planning on going extended. I have a, a message that's important. We're going to punch the devil in the face this morning. And, and we're going to begin. And I, I just wonder if you can get a bit excited just before we preach. I know some people came in late. Some of you missed your cappuccino, latte, double shot. And uh, this is a really good opportunity right now just to lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, we'll, we'll do this together. I've been doing this for many years. I'm trading my sorrows. Come on. I'm trading Come on, guys. Come on. I'm trading my patience. I'm trading my will. Who's all I have to love? I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm trading. as you uh, give someone a high five and take your seat, because sometimes we don't feel that way in the morning, do we? I'm going to need to uh, turn me up a little bit on my monitor, please. But we don't, do we? Sometimes we don't feel that way in the morning. Uh, I love what David said. In fact, in Psalms 5.3, it is described as this is written for piped instruments. He says, in the morning, Lord, 
you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and I wait expectantly. I want to say that again. I lay my request before you in the morning and I wait expectantly. The word expectantly is defined as with ex- an excited feeling that something good is about to happen. Father, this morning, I just thank you, Lord, as we just prayed for Pastor Steve. Father, we come against every bit of cancer in his body right now in the name of Jesus. We believe that we have been redeemed from the curse. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we do not fight for victory, but from victory. And right now, we say every attack, every assignment, every contract against them right now is canceled and deleted by the blood of Jesus. Father, I thank you that we plead in the courtroom, Father, that anything that is open that is being accused against them right now is just washed and pleaded by the blood of Jesus. Father, we declare right now that his body would be made whole in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for all of our community, Lord, that you place your hedge of protection around us. Father, that you have armies of the angels of heaven watching our family, our children, and our kids. And right now we stand by faith, Lord Jesus, expecting that something amazing is about to happen. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. I hope you've had a good week. If you are visiting uh, us here at Presence, Uh, Our mandate that we have on our church is to be a church that impacts the world through the message of Jesus, Uh, with the language of love and the heart of worship, a church that's discipling, that's raising leaders and transforming people, a growing community with a passion for the presence of God. Uh, We stand on the vision of three simple words that mean so much more is to love, to grow and to build. And as we move forward as Presence Church, I look forward to unpacking and diagnosing more of what God has placed on us Uh, as a church that loves the presence of God, uh, to see His weighty presence uh, manifest and touch our community in a a way that we've never experienced before. Uh, Just before I get into my message, I want to play a short snippet uh, for all of you. Yes, this is church, but there is a point to this. Check out the big screen. The volume will help, and from the beginning, guys. Look, okay, it's not my fault. I bet nothing's ever your fault, is it, darling? What? You have thrown away your life working in some silly Christmas shop. Baby, don't cry. Hey, Elf! This is my little helper. I have nicknamed her Lazy the Elf because she appears never to work. Father, if only Christmas get me out of here. What? Jesus, where'd you come from? Well, what are you looking at? I'll be a falcon. Oh, damn it. Uh, I think you just pooed in your eye. Yeah, I think so. It's good luck, you know. What is? Get pooed on, my bad. I'm busy, you're weird. Goodbye. You've missed five doctor's appointments. Mum is scared. So, uh, tell me about sleep. She never sleeps. Exercise? Religious Not at all. Alcohol? Oh, oh, she's drinking while. like the pirate. No, oh, okay, fine. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much for your time. Let's go, Mum. Oh, oh, fuck you! Again. What do you mean, again? Did you follow me here? Are elves always so cynical? Yes. Relentlessly, these are dark times. I'm Tom. Kate? Last Christmas. Here we are. This is the bit where you murder me. So what is it that you do? I sing. Oh, it's amazing. Anyway, boring, boring, boring. I'm not bored. You are so strange. <laughs> Where are you going? When that? Well, you're not homeless. No, I volunteer here. Uh-uh. Why didn't you just get saved, tattooed dude in your forehead? You were great at your job when you started, but now it's like you don't care anymore. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi. Come out. I'm a mess. I was really sick and I nearly died. I don't tell people because they get weird. But I don't think you'll get weird. No. I'm just scared all the time. Uh, they just expect me to be normal. I get on with life. There's no such thing as normal. You know, just being a human being is hard. Maybe you should do something nice for someone. Deck the halls with bells of holly. Fa la 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 la. Tis the season to be jolly. Oh boy. <laughs> I've been volunteering at the shelter. Seriously? This sounds like a healthy choice. What's wrong with you? 
I've been trying to find you. You keep disappearing. And then when I do bump into you, accidentally, I might add. It wasn't accidental. Why me? It's always going to be you. You like? <laughs> You're going to make mistakes, and that's okay. You're made of everything you do. So now that all the religious spirits have left the room, <laughs> I, I wanted to show you that because uh, maybe a fortnight ago, my, my wife said, hey, let's have a date night, which ultimately consists of the kids are in bed now, let's put on a movie. And, uh, and, and quite frequently, it will be uh, one of three scenarios. One, uh, I find a war movie and eventually win. Uh, two, we put on a, a love story and, and to which I watch YouTube fishing with headphones in. And, uh, and, and I actually thought I did really well. I found this movie about a fortnight ago, ago uh, last Christmas. And for some weird reason, my wife got up halfway through and went to bed. And, uh, and, and I watched it. And, and the end of the movie actually touched my heart. And for those of you who are going to go home now and watch it uh, in between services or for the afternoon, I'm going to spoil it for you. But it is a good movie. And um, the reason I wanted to show you that is because I think it speaks into the heart and the title that I want to speak to you about this morning which is enlarged expectation. Uh, I want to encourage you that we need to enlarge our expectation. Wherever you're at right now, I want to tell you your expectation hasn't reached its peak. It hasn't reached its roof. In fact, maybe it's hitting the ceiling and you need to get to the next level. I believe this morning, uh, the word that God has just laid on my heart and postponed over the last couple of weeks is specifically for today. I know I'm preaching it to myself this morning, but I want to preach this to you. And The reason I showed you that movie, this young girl in the beginning part of the movie, the young blonde girl, she's standing in a choir, she's all of about seven years old, and she's the the one at the very front, she's the one singing, and everyone is her backing core, and her sister, who you saw with the dark hair that says, mum's worried about you, you've missed all your appointments, is she's sitting next to her parents, kind of like the the naughty child, and in the movie, as it transpires in the, the... the day and the age as they move forward and grow up, the roles reverse. Her sister becomes a successful lawyer and she's lost and she's broken. This excitement that she had for life, this, uh, this, this, this ability to look up, maybe this, uh, this, this expectation she had that she was going to be a famous singer had started to dwindle. Even her boss that threw the thing at her head and called her the stupid elf. Uh, now uh, is staying to her. what happened to you once upon a time you used to be full of joy you used to be happy the reason I hired you she says in one part of the movie is she says you just had a way with people that they were attracted to you there was just something about you uh, and then all of a sudden on the scene this gentleman appears who I think is kind of like handsome he looks Filipino my wife said they're an unusual match I said that's usually what happens unusual people come together and make unusual babies and then we have more unusual people in the world I thought it was a good fit I thought that they would work well and what happens is they have this interaction and this contact and as you saw they keep bumping into each other But there are times throughout the movie where she goes looking for him in this uh, homeless shelter where he said he volunteers and she can't find him. In fact, there is a common theme as she's hanging out with him, probably one of maybe the six times throughout the course of the whole movie, uh, that she's on her phone, she's trying to find somewhere to stay, she's dragging her suitcase, she's trying to find a couch or somewhere to go to. And he would say to her, put your phone away and just look up. And obviously, one time, the first time, she she received a, a blessing from a bird. But throughout other times in the movie, and it really caught my heart, as she looked up, she would verbalize. She said, I walk past this every day for the last two years, but I've never noticed what's above me. And it was like a golden train thing that signified a shop corner, and it was just beautiful, like it was elegant. And throughout the movie, there are times where she's busy doing something and he will appear over the top of her. And and it's always an encouragement to look up. And what happens is eventually she spent enough time with him that something starts to happen within her heart. 
And she starts to go around and starts to repair the wrong she's done in relationships. She starts to uh, uh, make things right, starts to buy fish for people's fish that she killed. She buys her boss a coffee. She starts to mend relationships. And she had a falling out with this young man. And again, I'm going to spoil the movie for you. And as one night he took her to the apartment, what we discover in the movie, as you just saw, is she actually had a heart transplant operation, uh, and and the scar is revealed, it's very tame, kids can watch it, I think, Um, screen it first before you, pastor quotes that your kids should watch that, Uh, I I really don't think there was anything that bad in it, Um, but but, but there's this description and they're in this intimate moment, and, and she says, Once upon a time, I used to have my heart and I had this joy and this expectation, but now I feel like I've lost a part of me and gained something from someone else. And this young man starts to talk to her. And from that moment forward, she starts to realize that although she's received this heart transplant, it doesn't mean that everything's bad. In fact, it actually means it's a second chance at life. Uh, that now it's a new opportunity for an opportunity that she may not have had, that at just the right time and just the right place, there was an opportunity for this transaction of this heart to come in. They're in this apartment when this scenario takes place. They have a little bit of a disagreement of falling out in the path that you saw. And, and as they, they part ways, she looks for him and she, she can't find him anywhere. And then she goes around and she mends all the relationships. Her mother's a European. She's a little bit crazy and, and, and literally suffering with mental health. And she starts to get well. And the dad comes back and the daughter comes back. And all sorts of things happen. Every relationship. And at the end of the movie, she says, I'm going to go. And I say she went to try and mend her relationship with this gentleman, Tom. And as she approached the unit of the apartment that she'd visited once and she made the comment, it's pristine, it's clean, like you don't have any furniture or cups or plates or anything. And as she walks in, there's a young Indian looking gentleman there and she says, you're not Tom. And he said, no, I'm not Tom, I'm Ray or whatever his name was. And she said, he invited her in, he said, come in. And as she's standing there looking confused around the apartment, she, she, she said, where's Tom? And he said, there is no Tom, but let me show you the kitchen. And, and as a real estate agent would do, he starts to show the kitchen and then, and, and then different areas of the house. And she makes a comment because they find a phone. And as I alluded to, he would say, put your phone away and start looking up. In other words, have an enlarged expectation. And in that moment, he realizes that this Tom, this gentleman that you've seen, I'm just spoiling the movie for you, just saying, uh, Pastor Rick, the movie. And... Uh, And she realizes that this Tom actually never existed in a figure of a human person. It was actually the heart transplant donor uh, in in form of whatever you want to call it, spirit. I don't want to go down that path. But essentially what she's learning to do is learning to live a new life with this heart transplant that she's had. And she realizes in that moment, it's a flashback to him getting hit by his, on a bike, uh, by a car, and then his heart, and they both get wheeled into the surgery. So what ultimately happens is throughout the course of this movie, she has uh, and goes from a place of receiving a transplant or a transformation in her life uh, that she doesn't deem quite uh, acceptable or know how to live her life uh, that way. But throughout the course of this movie, she actually starts to find life again and starts to find joy. And I know it sounds a little bit peculiar in the way that I'm describing it. But what dawned on me and the reason I want to speak to you about it today is because I believe that some of us have actually had a heart transplant from God. In fact, anyone that's encountered or invited Jesus into their life, there is a transaction. The old man is gone and the new has come. But the problem is, some of us are living in a place where our expectation, where our joy, where our enlargement, our capacity, our vision for the things that God is going to do have actually been dulled by the circumstances of what's going on around us. Uh, I can attest to that even this week. uh, uh, We've had things going on in my family. But the level of your expectation determines the level of your life either good or bad. So if you have a level of expectation that's like today is going to be a terrible day, it's raining, the roof is leaking, we're going to fill barrels up today, that's probably what's going to happen. But if you have a level of expectation that today is a good day and I'm enjoying my life, today is a day that I've been redeemed, I've been set free, I am no longer under the curse, that I am not the tail, that I am the head, then then you're going to walk in victory. And as I said at the beginning, that's why David proclaimed in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. 
In the morning, I lay my request before you and I wait expectantly. Why? Because David had a relationship with God of such intimacy that he knew that if he just waited patiently and with an expectation that God would come through as God always did come through. As Isaiah says, my ways are not your ways, as your ways are not my ways. And I would say that timing and proximity is often an issue as human beings that we have that will actually cause a deadening to our hearts. But I want to remind you today that intimacy with one, the Word of God, literal, the Word of God, reading the Word of God, eating the Word of God, sleeping with the Word of God, praying the Word of God, getting into the Word of God on an intimate level will absolutely change your life. Faith and expectation are often synonyms, not synonyms, synonyms. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, that word can be translated expectation, so let it be done. I want to ask you, what is your expectation? What is your faith level today? Because we serve a God who has died, but then risen again, and he's seated at the right hand of God. We right now have the Holy Spirit marked as a seal within us. And the ability for the presence, the holy, the Shekinah glory, the, 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 the goodness of God to come and rest upon us, the dunamis power of God to see things that just don't, you don't see in the natural actually outwork through our hands, outwork through our voices as we partner with God in this life. Every year we would begin, I don't know, maybe you're like me, I'm probably in a year and a half of starting a one-year reading plan. In fact, I started one at the beginning of this year. It was a 40-day plan, and I checked it the other day, and I think I'm up to like day 14, um, and we're almost 40-something days into the year. But I do read my Bible every day and study and pray. I just love that you version has options and opportunities that when you get in your car, you can just have the Bible play over and over and over again. But one of the dangers in reading plans is that when we start from the beginning of the Bible and we go through, we get Genesis and we read Exodus and it's all good. It's the stories, all the men love the wars and the winds and how God comes in and conquers. But then we get to Leviticus and it's all about law and and the theologians and everyone that loves to read and bookworms. They're like, man, I love this stuff. But then when you get through, I think it's important to remind you and encourage you today just from a platform level that we shouldn't skip through books like Chronicles, uh, Nehemiah, and Esther, and Ezra, and Job, and Psalms, and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, all these books too quickly. Don't scream past all of the, uh, what should we call it, the the listings of names. There's another word for it. It's eluding me right now. Otherwise, you might miss gold, the genealogies. You might miss a lot of gold like the name Jabez. Jabez is a man whose name in the Hebrew means grief and sorrow. Beyond that, this is actually all we know about Jabez as we read from 1 Chronicles 4 verses 9 to 10. I'm reading from the New Living Translation purely today to give a little bit more exposure and insight. The scripture says, if you turn with me or have a look on the back screen, there was a man named Jabez who was honorable. In fact, he was more honorable than any of his brothers. Let me say that again because it's important. It was a man named Jabez who was more honorable than any of his brothers. His mother named him Jabez because of his birth. The birth had been so painful. He was the one who prayed to God, Oh Israel, oh that you would bless me. Oh expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from trouble and pain. The last part of that verse is, And God granted him his request. It said that in the year 2000, A gentleman wrote the book, The Prayer of Jabez, which I know at one time I had on my bookshelf, and probably many people in this room do as well. It was a bestseller, and there were good things said, and there were negative things said, being that the context of the whole book was based on two different sections, or only two portions of Scripture. But no matter what your thoughts are on the book, the reality is that Jabez stepped up that Jabez, for some reason, had a large or an enlarged expectation that God would come through with him, maybe just like the prayer that I read to you that David prayed in the morning. I would encourage you to add this prayer of Jabez to your morning prayer. 
Uh, I was talking to Pastor Steve the other day as I was in hospital and he was in an appointment and we were talking about scenarios and really just praying for each other. And I said, yeah, I'm probably going to speak on Jabez. And he said, man, I mate, and you know what Steve's like, he spoke for the next 10 minutes on the prayer of Jabez and how him and Kaz pray it before they get out of bed every morning. And I love that they're probably there praying it right now. But I love the prayer of Jabez because it's a biblical prayer that God and Jesus consistently teaches us about God's desires to intervene, to provide for our life, to expand our life, to protect our life, and actually to bless our lives. God wants you to expect Him to bless your life. God sent His only one, one and only Son into this world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. God didn't send his son into the world so that you could go on living a mundane life with a transplanted heart, that you would just live from couch to couch to couch with, with no expectation at all. God sent his son into this world that we would walk around being the light of the world, that we would be the ones that people are attracted to, that we would walk in promotion, that we would walk in victory, that we would walk in favor, that we would be people that walk elevated, being promoted far above anyone that doesn't know Christ, not because we're better than, because we have the favor of the son of God resting upon our life. But can I say this again, the level of your expectation will dictate the level of which your life is lived. The truth is we probably would never have heard of the prayer of Jabez or even stopped in this genealogy. In the lineages of the Bible, had not this sentence or this part been added to it, the last verse, these four, five words, and God granted his request. And God granted his request. As my head hit the pillow last night after I celebrated and had some time alone with my son and my nephew and my big Samoan brother-in-law watching the Kiwis demolish the Aussies at the rugby league. <laughs> Apparently I've got more American Indian blood in me than I do Maori blood. That's, uh, that's what my mother-in-law who obviously looks this stuff up told me. Um, but I tell you what, last night, the second row of Seabus Stadium, I felt like I was a full-blooded Kiwi all the, all the way, amen. And, and it was so good. But as I, my head hit the pillow, I was reminded of this, and I actually woke up to write this down. Is that all the references in the Bible that God highlights individuals, uh, such as David, who is known as a man after God's own heart, Noah was known as a friend of God. Enoch was listed, and again in the genealogies, as a man who walked with God, and then there was he was no more. All the way up until Jesus, who was the Son of God, which the voice came down twice, once at the baptism and once on the Mount of Transfiguration, saying, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. The times where Jesus, or should I say, God articulated down upon a man, was when that individual was pursuing the presence of God himself. It wasn't just God shone down and looked down and said, wow, there's a whole bunch of cool brothers. You know what? Jabez is praying bigger prayers than everyone else. No, I think it went far beyond just a prayer that he prayed in the secret place or before he got up in the morning. In fact, I believe his expectancy came as an overflow from the intimacy that he had in a relationship with the true living alive God. He didn't depend on just a Sunday service at, at Mount Carmel or wherever they were hanging out at this day and age in the tribe of Judah. He didn't depend on uh, or base his lifestyle or his prophetic name or, or name based on his birth, on his prophetic future. No, he, I believe that he was someone that actually intimately knew God. And I believe beyond a doubt, with a shadow of a doubt that God is encouraging us as a community, not just in this name change presence, which essentially I love, but my wife came up with. As we did that, God said to me, Justin, it's not just about the name change, it's about pushing reset. And not just pushing reset into the culture of what's happened, because we are the legacy of everything that's happened over the years. But the reset button is to push a community into not just a community that would pursue the presence of God, but that 
as a community, we would individually pursue the presence of God because then it wouldn't be just Jabez had a, a massive prayer of expectation. It would be Dave Mulder had a prayer of expectation. John Stephanie, J.J. Meyer, it would, be, it would be every single one of us. And right now, the way that we have and, and the availability that we have to be recognized and walk intimately with God is through the person of the Holy Spirit. It's through the anointing of God. God responded to his prayer of expectation and God considers, as the introduction of the scripture says, Jabez to be honorable. That word honorable in the Hebrew is used, it describes the weightiness of the glory of God. So the very first time that we hear about a man named Jabez that is only mentioned for two scriptures in the whole canon of scriptures or in the Bible, the first thing that we hear about him is God says that my weightiness of my presence of my glory was there with him. I was there intimately with him. I was spending time with him. I knew him that, that my goodness, that everything that radiated out of me was actually around him. And I want to tell you that that is available to you too today. Someone might be sitting here thinking, man, it's been two years, it's been three years since I've been this close, since I've walked in my call. I want to tell you in a heartbeat by just saying, God, would you come back in? Would you refresh the vision? Maybe it will take for some people a, a matter of days. Maybe for some of you, it's going to take a matter of weeks. I love what we spoke about last week in brief as Dr. Rodney came and he uh, mentioned his thoughts and it's expanded my heart about this notion of being in the upper room. And how the scripture tells us that there was 120 people on the upper room. In Acts chapter 2, it says, And on that day, suddenly, like the sound of a rushing wind, we know the Holy Ghost came in and baptized people with tongues of fire. But he says, and we think about on that day, there were many days that led up to that day. And he drew a point that has actually just shone in my heart. How many people actually entered the room on day one? Because I would put to you, as he put to us, that I firmly just have a confirmation with that there were probably more than 120 people. Remember when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter, the closest person to him, said, Jesus, I will go to death and I will go to jail with you. He says, I will never flee, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. But the Bible says as the guards led Jesus away and they took him, it says that Peter started to stray back. And it says... Before the rooster crowed that night, Peter had denied Jesus three times. So Jesus is there and he says, guys, go and wait in the upper room and wait for everything that my father has sent, the gift that he's going to pour out in the form of the Holy Spirit. I can't help but think there were people that dropped off the intimacy that they once had when they followed him. Day two, I think some more people probably dropped off day three and day four and day five. I'm saying this because I believe even now, in some way, shape, or form, the Holy Spirit is speaking to some people in this room. And you've had encounters with God in such profound, dynamic ways where the anointing and the power of God has rested upon you and you've felt it, you've experienced it, you've witnessed it, you've shared it, you've proclaimed it, and you've declared it. But over time, it's like there's been a separation of intimacy. There's been a separation of love. There's been trials and tribulations. Things have happened. People have died. Sickness has come. All of these scenarios have come, and that's not to paint a negative. This morning, God wants you to know that if you would just raise your expectation and place a dependency back on Him, that He will meet you where, he's, where you're at. He says He has never left you, and He will never forsake you. He says all you need to do is draw near to Him, and He will draw near to you. When God, the creator of heavens and earth, says, when you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. I want to tell you that your world will turn around. Your world will change. In fact, the world will turn around and he will do it for you to bring you back into a place of the inheritance that he created for you. My question for you today is, what are you expecting God to do in your life? In fact, do you still have an expectation for God to do something in your life? John 5 verses 14 and 15 says this, this is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that 
what we have asked. We know that we have what we have asked from him. Answered prayers today are your testimony for tomorrow. How many people have a testimony from yesterday that you would know was a prayer that you prayed the day before? You know, I, on Tuesday, my wife and I, we had a traumatic incident. Thank you for everyone that's praying. It's still happening. We've spent more time inside of a hospital and rooms this week, and it's personal, so please don't text her um, or I'll get in trouble, and there'll definitely be no lunch. Um, my mother-in-law's there with her now, but, you know, literally, I think, on Monday, we applied for another rental because we just had bad luck. Like, we just haven't been able to find a house. I found about 20 that I like and I could move into, uh, but she liked none of them, and she's the boss, so, so we just decided, hey, let's just take it easy. We'll go find another rental, and we'll just get on with life and enjoy it. And subsequently, we went to a rental, and we looked at it on a Friday, and Apparently, there's no rentals on the Gold Coast because there was like half of the Gold Coast at the showing. And I called her. I said, babe, we shouldn't even bother. Like, there's so many people here. And I met the agent and she said, you probably shouldn't bother. There's so many people here. And and this was all about a week and a half ago. And then on Tuesday, maybe Monday morning, I came home. I got called home from work. And to assist my wife, and we were waiting for some stuff to happen and, and, and Long story short, we had to go to the hospital, and she went in the ambulance. And 10 minutes before all of this happened, I got a call from the agent who called me two days before and said, Justin, sorry, the house has gone to someone else. I have to go through a list of like 200 people and tell them. um, But you know what? I told you, you probably shouldn't have applied anyway. When we found the house, I said, never mind renting it. I'll buy the house. We've been looking for that long. It's just a little four-bedroom house in Carrara. It's beautiful, perfect. No stairs, flat meets all the needs but she calls me back like 10 minutes before we are about to go through this traumatic experience as a family and she says justin the most weirdest thing has happened she says that the house that you wanted like the person has actually just dropped their application and they've been searching for so long that's why we gave it to them and she said i don't know why we already have four other approved names for the house she says, I just feel in my heart that I'm meant to give it to you guys. Do you still want it? And how quickly can you get it? You see, even when I went home in the midst of trauma and things were going on, and I was like, you know, like sort of like the anxious husband at that time, the prayers that I had prayed that morning is, God, would you intervene in an impossible situation? And would you make the possible, uh, the impossible possible? And I want to tell you the prayer that you pray in the morning, the prayer that you pray at lunchtime, the prayer that you're praying when you're driving down the road. If you have an intimate relationship with God, if you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior, anything is possible that nothing is impossible for God, for those who love him. Amen. There are four things that Jabez highlighted in his prayer, and there's not really a whole lot of directions that we can go in with the prayer of Jabez. But the first thing that Jabez says, if I were to highlight four things that we can actually capitalize on and that God wants us to capitalize on, is one is we need to expect God to bless you and increase his favor on your life. You need to walk around with the expectation, not with pride, not with with arrogance, but with the humility and a hunger that, no, I'm going to get my blessing today. You you know, someone shouted me, I love it, they they blessed me with the Karis Bible College post-study pastor's two-year intensive Bible college course. And whenever I upgraded my iPad, which was twice during the time of doing this course, which I'm still doing because I'm a pastor and we take a long time to do things, I would call up and it would be Andrew Wallback Ministries and I'll never forget every time I, I would greet this gentleman and we'll just call him Tom and I'd say, hey Tom, how are you doing? He's like, blessed and highly favored by the Lord, my brother, how are you? Uh, call him again, how are you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored by the Lord, my brother, how are you? Blessed and highly See, see, that's the expectation that we should have. We should be prophesying over our life, but, you know, the doom and the gloom and I understand because I've even been in it this week where it's like, man, I actually just don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But with God, all things are possible, which actually seem impossible to the natural eye. Jabez prayed this in the beginning part of his prayer. Oh, that you would bless me. Oh, that you would bless me. 
If you have an intimate relationship with God, I want to tell you that you will pray with a confidence and a boldness and an expectancy. And let me say this again, with boldness, oh, that you would bless me. If you're someone that's not walking intimate with God and you're more condemned by your shame and your sin and you don't realize the grace and the mercy that has freely been given to you and all you need to do is turn around and just turn to Him, then, oh God, would you bless me is actually a really hard statement. But the moment that you turn away, that you repent, even in the moment someone now, maybe you're just saying, God, would you just just forgive my heart for thinking that way? Realign me. Realign my thoughts. I want to tell you, (coughs) you qualify yourself and you give yourself or you should give yourself permission to declare that. Because Jesus hung on the cross, his blood was shed so that you could actually call down the things of heaven as though they are in heaven on earth now if that makes sense. This is not a selfish prayer or praying outside the will of God. I wouldn't recommend a pray to bring suffering or pain as no one would. But a life, in fact, life will supply that without asking for it. When favor comes, things arrive and they begin to click. Doors open faster. Connections happen that bring increase and opportunities arrive without self or or need for self-promotion. Favor is a gift that we can ask for, and it positions we need to position our lives to receive. Remember, God considered Jabez honorable because he had an expectation and an ask that God would bless him. And Jabez was different from his brothers. God saw him as honorable. Why? Because he had the confidence and the expectation to ask God to bless him. Some of us are like, no, Jesus died on the cross. He did it all. He did it all so that he could impart the Holy Spirit into you, that now you could walk as coheres in relationship, that you wouldn't walk just expecting the world to just fall into its place. Because I want to tell you, it ain't going to happen. But when you understand that you have the dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit accessible to you, and not that he's just like a puppy dog that you carry on a leash, he's the person of the Godhead that he wants to walk with you and move through you then there's a little bit more of an emphasis on, oh God, would you bless me? Knowing that he's right here and that he's right now with you, moving and shifting things amongst you. The second thought I have for you, and I'll be done in just a few moments as the band comes. God, expect God to increase your influence and your territory. Just then I had a thought that popped into my mind. Coming through transformations, I used to come into this auditorium. There used to be a wall right down the middle where this column is. There was a double blessed besser block wall. And Mike Barrett always used to quote this quote that someone prophesied that transformations would build the church. And he'd always walk in here clean and we'd be dirty as residents. And it would be 4 a.m. because we'd bother everyone else in the building and we'd be up there with jackhammers. And Pastor Kent would be trying to lift pieces of concrete. And, and, and assisting in buying us all lunch and drinks. But I remember, I remember coming into this auditorium as a broken, lost, young drug addict, part of a rehabilitation program that essentially saved my life, uh, that was birthed out of the heart of this church uh, and essentially now is down the road. But I remember coming into this auditorium and spending hours upon hours upon, in fact, almost all of from the end, Boxing Day 2005 to so really, when I graduated, I still cleaned the church after I graduated the build, the, the thing, the program. I'm just having a transient moment here. I've translated back to all those hours of getting rid of bricks and mortar. But God will increase your influence in your territory. Sometimes it takes for us to put our hands to the plow. Jabez just asked, he said, God that you would enlarge my territory. You know, it's funny that God puts you in places that he actually wants you to rule and reign in. It's funny, like like we wouldn't, God never put me in addiction. He never put a meth pipe or a syringe full of heroin in front of me. But what God did is he turned all things that were negative against my life for the good. And he's already restored it a hundredfold in this lifetime. And I can't wait for the life to come, to be quite honest with you. But even now in that moment that I stopped and I stalled and It's funny that for so many years, I thought I was just being punished or or 
consequential thinking was being instilled in me for the wrongs that I was in here doing things. But now as I stand as the facilitator of, of a multi-million dollar building, really a guardian on behalf of God, it's our church, it's yours as much as it is mine. And, and stewarding tenants and business and staff, I know that I know that I know that if you would raise your expectancy and you would start to pray, God, would you enlarge my territory? Because I want to tell you, when I went to bed at night, the things that I would pray is, God, help me to not want to be in addiction. Help me not to be bored. Help me to actually grow. Help me to have a house. And I, I, I find it funny because my prayer was, God, give me a house with a white picket fence and a family. And God's gone beyond that and he's multiplied that. He's actually brought all my family to me. And, and then he's doing more and more. This should be a prayer over your finances, over your business ventures, over your real estate, and over your church. We are asking God for more influence in our city, in our territory, where the kingdom of God has come, His will be done. One writer said, one writer, one writer said this, the way this happens corporately as individually, as believers, corporately is as individual believers who are virtually or vitally connected to the local church expand and experience increase our blessing and expansions are always for the purposes that are bigger than us the third thought that i have for you is expect god to give you guidance and clarity for the future jabez said this and that your hand would be with me god's hand speaks of his guidance and his direction some of us are so used to seeing hand of the father the hand of our mother in a negative connotation but the hand of god actually is is the opposite it speaks of guidance and direction sometimes he leads and other times he points we need to ask god and we need to step out by faith believe that god is going to give you some specific details and clear guidance as you take some big steps of faith into your future remember that we need to give him a reason to bring fresh guidance. In other words, we need to have intimacy and a large expectation. You can't steer a parked car once someone once said, let's move forward in expectancy. And the fourth thought and the last thought I have for you is, I know the worship team's here and Pastor Kent's about to come, is expect God to keep you from failure, temptation, and sin. This is a big one because... A lot of teachers, a lot of theologians, a lot of YouTube would say, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing this. The truth is that God gives you the strength to resist. The scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. In other words, make a conscious decision in your mind. Take ownership of your thoughts as you renew your mind. Do not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember, intimacy and presence and encounter will transform your heart, but the Word of God will transform your mind. It will instill roadblocks that will cause you. And I want to tell you this. If you're walking in intimacy, it doesn't mean two weeks ago I hung out with God. It means yesterday, today, right now, I know that the presence and the anointing of God is with me. Because in that moment, when you know that the anointing and walking in intimacy and you're a person of the presence... What that means is that you're more aware of God than you are. So when something abstract to the kingdom of God presents itself, be it a dream, be it a temptation, be it a short skirt, be it something on the internet, be it whatever, be it just, just someone annoying you when you're driving down the road. It happened to me this morning. I was driving here. Someone cut, off, cut me off and I was like worshiping and I'm like, like literally in my mind's eye, I was like, why would I lose my peace? over this person when I'm like worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. L like I want to tell you, I had every right to put on the old nature this morning. But every part of me, because I'm walking in the presence and walking aware of his anointing and the mantle and the transformation work and the price that he paid to get me to the place that I'm at, regardless of the natural circumstances that are going on, I know that I still need to raise my expectancy because God is able to do far more than I can even imagine. And I want to tell you, He can do it in your life too. Jabez was not asking for a trouble-free world, but simply praying a form of prayer that Jesus would and teach us to pray nearly a thousand years later. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
like this, perhaps Jabez knew intuitively that with prosperity and favor comes temptation and persecution. So he was actually asking God prophetically for divine protection in advance. Jabez prayed, oh, that you would bless me. Oh, that you would enlarge my territory. And oh, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil. He prayed all of the blessings and the promises and the declarations first, but then prayed for God to guide him in the very things that God was going to provide him with. As we close today and as we pray, I feel like my mandate this year and even in this moment, at least anyways, from God is to continue pushing us individually and encouraging every one of you in here. I just hope you're catching it. It's like, I just feel like like Holy Spirit's just touching people, like just drawing you back. He wants to bring you back to the secret place, take you back to the place. You know, I hear stories about people from Surf City Church. I'm not going to name names, but I hear stories about, oh, I remember turning up at that building and that someone, Mr. Frank Williams, used to be the Holy Ghost guy. Sorry, Frank. Uh, but, but, but I hear stories about this person and this person and this person. I want to tell you, it's not because of the worship team. It's not because Pastor Richard's not right here right now. Uh, and, and again, I'm sorry, Frank. I shouldn't have said Frank. <laughs> it wasn't Frank, okay, everyone? Stop judging him. This is church. But I want to tell you that the activation, we saw it. I saw it a year and a half ago. Last year, the beginning of the year in the prayer meeting, God said to me that there are generals seated all over this auditorium, all over the Gold Coast, and they have their swords swords and their sheath, which is the sword of the Spirit. But it's actually clipped over and buttoned up because they actually haven't yielded it. They're not walking in an intimacy level that they once upon a time had. And the truth is, that's not a negative. That's actually a drawing of God saying, come back. Would you come back? That, that he wants to draw you back to the secret place. Uh, see, any time that we think that we've arrived at the place that, 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 hey, man, this is where I should be as a Christian. I want to tell you that there is more. There is more. I'm at home uh, during the week and my wife's going through trauma. I'm reading this, this book on the anointing from Dr. Rodney Howard Brown. And it's the most simplest stuff. But I'm like, God, I just want more of you because I know there is more of you. Yeah, I read about you. Yeah, I encounter your presence. But God, I want to know you like I know you. Like when Moses said, God, would you reveal yourself to me? I can't help but think that he had encountered God in a pretty dynamic, alive, real way. But there was something about him that said, I'm not content with this. I want to know more about you. I, I want to get closer to you. I want to walk in more intimacy with you. And how many of you know that that intimacy level that he had actually sustained him through the hardships that he went through? See, we serve a good, good God. Even when we can't feel it, he's working. Even when we can't see it, he's doing something. That's who he is. That's who he is. I'm going to close with this scripture and Pastor Kent's going to come and take over. David, in the Amplified Psalms 25 verse 3, he says, Indeed, none of those who expectantly wait will be ashamed. It's, it's, a, it's a confirmation. It's a spirit-breathed word from God. And I want to tell you this morning, none of you who expectantly wait will leave ashamed. God's about to do something in your life. You know, even as I say that, my natural mind goes, that's a bit of a cliche. How many times have people said that from the stage? I want to tell you, if you would raise your expectation, if you would understand that the old man has gone and the new man has come, that the heart transplant has happened, that all it takes for you is to start to look up again, that God will pour out something new and something fresh. That's why it's called the new wine, not the stale wine, not the old wine, not the stored wine, but it's the new wine of the Holy Ghost, and He will do something. Would you stand with me? Come on, let's give Him a shout this morning.